Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so it's time to start our webinar on vector symbolic architectures and thank you for coming. So uh, great to see um, uh, both old and new names uh, among the participants. Uh, so before I hand the word to Alexander, who is going to present uh, on uh, today's webinar, just uh, one short announcement. Uh, it looks like, um, so, I mean, all people working with VSA go into vacation mode. Uh, so uh, it was kind of hard to, to find speakers for the uh, uh, for July. So uh, I decided uh, we go on short vacations. So uh, you see, I uh, have announced two talks um, uh, in August, but uh, so there will be no uh, webinars in July, uh, uh, unless uh, you really want to present an extremely hot topic and we will schedule it separately. Uh, but uh, that's it. Uh, I also want to say that I'm collecting uh, co contributions for the uh, winter session already. So please um, don't be shy, send me your suggestions or I mean about your own talks or maybe um, talks you want to hear from other people so that I can uh, contact them and ask to present. But uh, today's topic, uh, uh, today's webinar will be presented by Alexander Demidovsky from uh, Russia. So without any further delay, I hand the word to him. So uh, Alexander, the floor is yours. I'm muting myself. Thanks. Uh, hello again. Uh, today uh, I will talk about uh, hybrid neural architecture for the linguistic operator in decision support systems. So before I, I actually start uh, uh, presenting uh, my materials, uh, small, uh, small acquaintance uh, with me. So I'm a PhD student at the High School of Economics in Nizhny Novgorod in Russia. So uh, it's uh, another Novgorod other than uh, great. So it's Nizhny Novgorod. Uh, the planned thesis is the development of sub-symbolic distributed models in multi-criteria decision-making tasks. Apart from uh, being a student uh, at the university and uh, as a lecturer there, I'm also working at Intel. Uh, maybe you have heard about the OpenVINO framework uh, for optimal inference of uh, neural networks. So if you have any questions, let me know. I will try to help you. And also contributed to the open source um, in my spare time. So the talk uh, today uh, will, will be uh, split into five parts. Uh, first of all, we will uh, get some context of what is a decision support system. Uh, then uh, we will understand what are the challenges uh, of building neural symbolic uh, decision support systems. And then we will focus on uh, knowledge representation and reasoning in such systems. And uh, I will show uh, some practical results obtained to this moment. And of course, uh, we will uh, formulate uh, the directions for further research and uh, uh, make some conclusions. So the decision support system, the definition uh, you can find on the slide. Here I want to highlight uh, that a decision support system is intended to help decision makers uh, to make uh, their decisions by using data, knowledge, and models. So these uh, three elements uh, will be critical for the talk today. And uh, also, uh, if we take a look at uh, where decision support systems live, they are a natural part of the management information systems, uh, being uh, on the same level as the transaction processing systems. But the key difference is that TPS is the mostly automated uh, uh, collection of data, uh, non-structured data, and decision support system is uh, an interactive system that helps decision makers to make the decision. So as you can see, there are several types of decision support systems according to the powers uh, 
uh, taxonomy. So we will focus on the knowledge-driven DSS and more specifically on the intelligent DSS. So one, uh, when we talk about uh, intelligent DSS, we need to understand uh, what is, what does it mean to be intelligent in this context? So the, the first um, and the main uh, goal of such systems is uh, to learn from experience. Uh, also, it is very important uh, for such systems to use reasoning to solve problems and infer in rational uh, ways. And uh, also, as we will learn a bit later, is recognizing the relative importance of various factors in a decision. So, uh, if we take a look uh, inside uh, the decision support system, so typically we will see that there are three main components. So, the the first one is uh, a representation. So, how do we represent the knowledge? Then, uh, how do we uh, perform reasoning? And also, there is the third part, which is the communication component together with the user interface. So, of course, uh, we're interested mostly in these two parts, while this one uh, being some sort of uh, implementation details. So, when uh, we talk about intelligent decision support systems, then uh, we need to recognize that uh, they evolved on top of knowledge-driven DSS. So uh, we all know that uh, there were expert, expert systems in the uh, 90s, they're still there. So in, uh, in many uh, fields, uh, expert systems are still alive. So it's, knowledge intensive programs uh, capturing expertise in a limited domain. So if we have an expert, then uh, they provide some knowledge and then we store it somehow in the decision support system and use it for uh, assisting the decision maker. So what knowledge uh, we usually uh, have, it is uh, the rules, so if then and uh, even in, in the era of uh, like uh, dramatic improvements of uh, neural networks, deep learning and uh, uh, elements of narrow artificial intelligence, uh, many systems, uh, if not saying the, the most, uh, are still based on the rules. And also, as we will see later, uh, the knowledge can be also represented as assessments. It can be structured and unstructured and so on. So, and intelligent DSS are usually referred to as uh, DSS that have some artificial intelligent uh, techniques embedded into. So, and uh, why do we need those uh, elements of artificial intelligence? We need them to uh, overcome uh, the widespread inability to assist in real time. So unfortunately, most of the decision support systems nowadays are not able to work um, and uh, uh, assist uh, based on the previous experience and uh, working in the complex environments. So uh, imagine we have a decision uh, support system that is working on top of the uh, huge amount of stakeholders and uh, agents, then every agent might, uh, might want to have their own uh, goals they conflict in, they can be some opportunistic uh, behavior and so on. So most of the DSS are not able to assist in those cases. And for that, uh, there are three main directions where, where DSS have elements of the artificial intelligence. The first one is the fuzzy logic. So we usually uh, use it to, to express uncertainty and uh, incompleteness. And as we can see later, uh, human assessments that are natural made in the form of uh, natural language, uh, then artificial neural networks uh, to introduce some learning capabilities. And as I said, it is one of the primary goals of building intelligent DSS and uh, intelligent agents to model dynamic and uncertain environments. To uh, give you some more examples uh, of uh, real life uh, decision support systems, here, here is uh, the table containing uh, the DSS uh, evolved uh, 
some, some selected DSS evolved in the past uh, two decades. As, as we can see uh, here, uh, most of the DSS uh, are targeting the MCDM, uh, which stands for multi-criteria decision-making. And uh, also we note that uh, uh, fuzzy logic uh, becomes uh, a mandatory part of uh, decision of modern decision support uh, systems. So these were papers from the last two decades and uh, here are papers from the last two years. So um, as we can see, the, the tendency is still there. So it is a multi-criteria decision-making with fuzzy logic embedded. Uh, in general, um, I have analyzed uh, 161 paper and, uh, and uh, it is clear that uh, besides the fuzzy computations and uh, multi-criteria decision-making as the most popular direction, uh, we also note that uh, there is no other reasoning but symbolic in those systems. Uh, we clearly see that there is a business requirement of the decision support system to be fully explainable and uh, or interpretable at least for the decision maker. And then uh, we need some, uh, some computationally effective knowledge representation so that we would be able to, uh, uh, to leverage uh, some recent advances uh, in the artificial intelligence field. So as a multi-criteria decision-making uh, is uh, so popular use case, so let's better understand what, uh, what, what it is. So here is the example of the standard uh, well-known uh, paper uh, in the field. And uh, the, the problem is that as a, as a business owner, I want to choose uh, the best operation system. So, um, so generally I'm not the expert in that field. I invite someone who can help me. And uh, then uh, the expert shares uh, their opinion. And uh, finally, I need to decide uh, what uh, alternative do I choose. So here is uh, uh, this, this simple uh, metric. So alternatives versus criteria. And the thing here is that the experts shared their opinion. They estimated each alternative by each criteria. But how can I work with it, uh, with these assessments? Please note that they are made in the linguistic form. And according to the, to the recent research, uh, first of all, for experts, it is natural and it is easier to provide uh, unstructured uh, assessments. So in, in the form of natural language. And uh, also there, there can be, and there are actually, criteria that are quantitative. So we get, we're used to, we get used to uh, working with the qualitative assessments, but uh, quantitative, quantitative assessments are also there and we need to consider them as well. So, uh, so the first thing is how to compute and uh, find the best alternative by using these assessments. But the things go even uh, more complicated when uh, we realize that uh, criteria can have different deponents. For example, cost uh, may be much more important for us than uh, risks. Then uh, criteria can be qualitative, as I said. Um, and also there are many experts. So we can ask uh, more than one expert, especially if we have some, some hard problem that we need to solve. And, uh, and these experts, uh, they can be of different expertise. So they can even understand uh, the same word differently. So, uh, and there are many more uh, challenges that, uh, that make the multi-criteria decision-making um, quite a complicated field. So in order to tackle uh, all the problems that I just enumerated, uh, the, uh, such systems uh, use uh, different approaches. And the first one is using fuzzy logic. 
and uh, the uh, the family of approaches here is called linguistic decision making where uh, we translate the linguistic assessment of an expert to the uh, scale with a triangular membership function and then uh, after performing uh, some manipulation with these assessments we can uh, always get the linguistic output. So the thing here is that we provide linguistic assessments like uh, on the previous slide, good, quite good. Then we perform some manipulation and as a result of this manipulation, we again get the linguistic information. The thing here is that it is very uh, natural and it is very convenient for the decision making maker as uh, uh, as the solution is not just the number, but some word that is uh, uh, clearer for the decision maker. So how does it work? So quite, quite simple. So we, when we have a set of linguistic assessment expressed in terms of two tuple, then uh, by using uh, special rules, we translate those uh, assessments to numbers then we make some simple for example averaging and then after that we translate that numeric representation to a uh, two tuple so here i'm not uh, uh, trying to like uh, make you all understand uh, uh, what is going on here but the main idea is that we uh, we are able to translate linguistic assessments to the numbers and from numbers to linguistic assessments. And this makes the decision-making process transparent for the decision-maker. And this is a key requirement, key business requirement for such systems. So uh, as I have said, explainability is one, uh, one requirement and adoption, being able to adopt for time is another critical business requirement. And here is where we meet the symbolic and sub-symbolic paradigm. So uh, as soon as the most of the decision support systems are symbolic, so they're highly interpretable, they're easy to control and they allow predefined rules. But at the same time, uh, we want to make our systems scalable, learnable and distributed. As soon as uh, there is also a growing trend and need in integrating decision support systems in so-called fog architectures or massive parallel environments. So, and this brings us uh, to the thought that the decision support systems of future uh, should be neural symbolic. So they should uh, uh, combine uh, best of two worlds of symbolic and sub-symbolic. Uh, even uh, if we agree that it, this is uh, true, but then the question is what parts should be symbolic and what no. So um, here, uh, just to highlight uh, that explainability uh, requirement is not just a business requirement, but also a governmental requirement. So here we can see some snippets from official government documents from leading uh, countries like the US, uh, Canada, from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, that they are all saying that explainability is a critical thing for systems that have elements of artificial intelligence. And as we have already learned, intelligent DSS is what we currently develop and uh, we are going to develop in future. They contain pieces of AI and they, from day one, uh, they should be explainable in order to be used uh, in a wide uh, manner. So, uh, neural symbolic systems. So, we decided that our decision support systems should be neural symbolic. So, it is uh, always uh, uh, quite uh, a good idea when we understand uh, what are the types, so the taxonomy and uh, uh, where we are with the current state. So according to the uh, great talk from Henry Kautz, and I highly recommend uh, to watch it, I will share the slides uh, so you will be able to follow up. Um, there, there are six types of uh, neural symbolic systems and uh, 
uh, from uh, simple systems that are currently widespread uh, when we have symbols as, or like natural language uh, uh, as the input and then uh, we pass it to the neural network so to the to the sub symbolic system or to the neural system and then as a result we get another symbols for example question answering or machine translation and uh, so they grow these uh, neural symbolic systems uh, they grow to the true symbolic reasoning inside a neural engine which uh, now is uh, not uh, yet uh, achieved uh, milestone. And here I highlight uh, systems of type four and type five, as I believe that uh, the systems uh, that uh, are going to appear and uh, those that uh, I'm trying to contribute to are uh, of type four or type five, depending on uh, the approach uh, that we're going to use. So, and Mm, here I'm just referring to the fact that uh, uh, tensor product representations uh, are um, placed in the type 5. Here is uh, the recent paper by Garces and Lamp. Uh, also highly recommend to read it. Uh, uh, they, uh, they discuss the topics of neural symbolic AI and also um, proving why uh, tensor product representations uh, systems are of type five. Nevertheless, uh, we proceed uh, to the definition of neural symbolic decision support system. So we were taking the same definition as before, and now I'm just highlighting uh, what I think uh, a neural symbolic decision support system is. So, uh, from my understanding, uh, neural symbolic DSS is capable to robustly learn, efficiently scale, and leverage artificial intelligence advances. And of course, it is a decision support system, so it continues to help decision makers to make the decisions by using those key elements. And here, uh, I'm also referring to the great talk from David Cox, uh, um, that was given last year. So about the neural symbolic hybrid AI and uh, about um, current state of the art. So if we talk simpler than uh, if we want to bring neural symbolic decision support systems, then we need to bring neural, uh, some, something neural to the existing symbolic uh, uh, elements of the decision support system. So we need to bring something uh, sub-symbolic to the representation part of the DSS and to the reasoning part of the DSS. So my current research question are, uh, are split into these two parts. So how do we and how should we represent knowledge in neural symbolic DSS, including uh, encoding scheme, uh, as well as encoding for the two tuple structures, as uh, they are the most general ways of expressing uh, experts assessments. So they, are, they allow us to encode qualitative and quantitative assessments. Then uh, the second part of the research is uh, reasoning in neural symbolic DS, uh, DSS. So what is the reasoning and uh, how can we make this reasoning learnable? So the first challenge is knowledge representation. So here, if we uh, show it in abstract form, then uh, there is a symbolic knowledge at the beginning, and uh, then there is a sub-symbolic system, a symbolic system, and a decision maker. So the, the first thing here is that uh, the symbolic knowledge uh, should be somehow encoded to the sub-symbolic system, and then it should be decoded to be used in the symbolic subsystem. So as we're talking about neural symbolic, so then we're talking about integrated solutions, so they coexist. So they cannot be just sub-symbolic, for example, DSS. So we need to find a way to encode and decode symbolic knowledge needed for multi-criteria decision-making. So as we are focusing on MCDM, then let's consider this use case. And here we need uh, zero information loss. 
So what is the symbolic knowledge? Symbolic knowledge in our case is experts assessments, is alternative solutions and criteria. So everything needed for the expert and for the decision maker to work with uh, the problem definition. And it, it, um, it turns to be uh, the fact that uh, knowledge about the problem in decision support systems is purely hierarchical. And the hierarchy here is that there are alternatives, then uh, there are experts that uh, respond uh, for each alternative, then there are groups of criteria and uh, particular criteria, and then the assessments. So the symbolic knowledge uh, for the decision support system in the MCDM case is a, a hierarchical thing. And if so, then it is natural to uh, decide to use trees as a data structure. And now the, the question is how to encode trees in a tensor form. And, uh, and here, uh, it is, uh, it is not uh, the surprise that um, uh, there is a tensor product representations. And last time, um, two weeks ago, we were uh, watching uh, the lecture by um, Paul Smolensk and Coleman Haley. Uh, here is again the reference to the talk. Uh, when they well described uh, what is the tensor product representation, I'm not going and I don't pretend to to be explained better than, uh, than them, but uh, just uh, to understand that with tensor product representations, it is possible to represent a simple structure, a simple tree in a tensor form uh, by using a tensor product. So, and if so, so if we are able to, um, to encode uh, the tree into the tensor, so into the sub-symbolic form, uh, then the only thing that we need to do with our knowledge that we already defined is to express this um, knowledge tree uh, with uh, the specifics of the tensor product representations encoding. For that, we allocate necessary uh, roles uh, they are well predefined, and then uh, this tree can be efficiently encoded into the uh, vector form. So uh, here, uh, what we get? So we get the uh, the opportunities for the end-to-end -end system to appear that is capable to process problem knowledge in a sub-symbolic manner. So we encode the whole knowledge into the vector and then pass it to the sub-symbolic uh, subsystem. And also we can, we can build a smaller subsystem that is capable to aggregate uh, assessments. So we just extract assessments from that tree and then encode them uh, separately in a vector form. And then uh, we pass it again to the sub-symbolic uh, subsystem. The second thing here is that uh, we need to, to express reasoning. And uh, here, here is another thing that is uh, quite specific to the decision support systems. Uh, in the MCDM, uh, we have two types of reasoning. So the first one is DSS reasoning, which is assessment aggregation. In other words, uh, aggregating all the uh, assessments that were given by experts, in order to understand what alternative is the best one. And the second one is uh, the decision maker reasoning. So actually it, it is the decision maker who makes the final selection. So, and uh, that's why the decision maker reasoning cannot be sub-symbolic. So it is always symbolic, while DSS reasoning can be sub-symbolic. And when we talk about this reasoning, then it should incorporate historical knowledge. And uh, ideally it would also automatically assign weights for criteria and experts. Remember, we were talking that uh, different experts can have different expertise. So ideally, ideally we want to assign a uh, higher weight to an expert who is uh, considered to be an, uh, an expert rather than assign high weights uh, 
uh, to the non-expert uh, person. So, and uh, the important thing here is that DSS reasoning must provide interpretable results. So we cannot uh, just make some numbers or uh, output some vectors and uh, give them to the decision maker as the result. And here, uh, as I said, we are trying to express ag assessment aggregation. And in this case, um, we already have the tree. So here I'm showing the symbolic uh, counterpart, but we understand that uh, um, I'm using uh, the uh, already encoded representation of this tree, but nevertheless, uh, we express, we extract the assessments by using the TPR extractor, we, uh, as we know that there is a lossless way of unbinging the uh, data, we can extract assessments from the tree. Then uh, we encode them uh, in the distributed representation and pass it to the uh, sub-symbolic aggregator that uh, incorporates historical knowledge, that uh, knows uh, and uh, assigns proper weights. And then uh, after we get the aggregation result, we allocate the new row in the tree and uh, just append it with the new data. So with the TPRs, it is possible to, to do. So we enrich the original knowledge tree with some new knowledge, which is an aggregation result. So we made that. So we just made aggregation on the criteria level. So there are more levels to proceed and we are going through them in the same manner. So once we are on the level of groups of criteria, we extract them from the knowledge tree, again, pass it to the uh, aggregator, and then we pass it back and enrich the knowledge tree with new data. Of course, the assessment aggregator here in general is different from the assessment aggregator on the previous step because uh, this aggregator would assign proper uh, weights to the group criteria while the previous one would assign weights uh, for the single criteria. And finally, at the end of the aggregation phase, we get the final assessment assigned for each alternative. And then uh, the decision maker can first of all highly and easily interpret the result because it is made in the linguistic form. And also uh, they can sort the alternatives uh, in the decreasing order. And uh, for example, take the first alternative with the biggest assessment and uh, take it as the solution. So in summary, in order to express MCDM reasoning, we need uh, several parts. So the first one is encoded knowledge tree. The second is uh, extracting and ability to extract certain parts from the TPR, uh, which uh, contains the knowledge tree. Then we need a joiner uh, network that would in contrary enrich the knowledge tree with aggregated assessments. And we need a two top two tuple NNN aggregator. So now uh, talking about the results. So as we identified uh, the necessary parts, so let's uh, see one by one what um, what is available to this moment. So speaking about uh, the reasoning uh, and the extracting of the certain data from the encoded tree. So here is the symbolic example. And uh, here is uh, the uh, definition in terms of the tree operations. So according to the tensor product representations, there is a lossless way to extract certain fillers, uh, certain elements uh, by, by their role, by their position in the structure. So here, uh, here is uh, the short uh, definition, uh, how it can be made, as well as the neural architecture that uh, has uh, these uh, extraction rules and uh, joining rules encoded as weights. 
The second part is uh, the joining, uh, joining operation. So when we have, uh, for example, two elements, like this uh, independent element and this small tree, and we want to join it into the single tree. In our case, we need it to add new assessments to the knowledge tree. So, and again, it is possible to do with the uh, TPR rules by using a specially compiled neural network that does not require training, where the, where the manipulation rules are encoded as uh, weights. And then uh, we apply this network to the, to, the, to the necessary parts and get the TPR, which contains encoded uh, tree, which contains uh, these uh, two elements as its new uh, children. So the final and the most important part here is, uh, is a, a neural architecture for two tuple uh, aggregation. So as we have already learned, uh, there is a symbolic rule of how we work with two tuples. So we need to translate them back to numbers and then we need to perform some mathematical operation. So once we want to make the, uh, the reasoning uh, happening on the sub-symbolic level, so we need something uh, something sub-symbolic that would accept two tuples as the input, uh, respond with a new two tuple, which will stand for the result of aggregation. That would do two things. First of all, it would aggregate two tuples. And the second thing, it will learn how to decode and to encode tensor product representations. So this is a, this is quite challenging task. And uh, therefore, uh, we start from a simpler task, which is uh, let's uh, avoid uh, making the sub-symbolic system learning the TPR and coding and decoding rules. Instead, let's focus and try to find a neural architecture that is capable to learn some complex algorithm. For example, that uh, uh, average uh, weighted average that we see on the previous slide. And here the proposal is to use uh, the neural Turing machines architecture for two tuple aggregation. So here, uh, and this is uh, actually really great that uh, uh, at the VSA online, we had uh, so many great talks. So I'm again referring to the first talk this, uh, at, uh, uh, at this season uh, by Koronoratne uh, Gita, so about uh, the neural Turing machines. And uh, I, again, I'm not going to talk uh, a lot about this architecture, but we need to know two important things. The first one is that NTM uh, learn faster and generalize better than LSTMs. It was shown in uh, the original paper by Graves, here is uh, the reference. And also uh, NTM architecture allows to separate computation from memory. So actually neural Turing machine are example of memory augmented neural networks. And by the fact that there is an external memory, external to the controller network, it allows it to, to keep more. So uh, not to forget much more data. And uh, there is a, a very interesting uh, property of the neural Turing machine uh, is that uh, they are capable of learning simple algorithms. So, but before we um, dig into that uh, fact, we need to understand that um, NTM accepts a sequence of vectors and returns sequence of vectors. So it is a, a purely and a, a, it is a dynamic recurrent neural network. So the input sequence and output sequence can be different. So for example, we encode some expression, we give it to the network uh, piece by piece, and then we collect the final result. So in order to uh, solve the new use case with NTM, we need to translate the input data in the corresponding format. And in our case, uh, once we decide to make the aggregation, 
uh, we express it according to the well-known uh, rule uh, when we represent our arithmetic expression like this uh, we express it by using the binary string here it is the first column is a binary string with a little ending format while uh, other bits are, are allocated for the markers for example this plus is allocated for uh, is uh, represented as uh, one in this channel and so on so this is a, a way of encoding the arithmetical task and uh, feeding it into the neural Turing machine. And if we encode arithmetic expression in this way, uh, we will see that uh, NTM is able to solve and to learn this algorithm uh, for the uh, four bit and 10 bit numbers. So, and after that, it generalizes well, and it can solve the sum task, even when uh, the sample was not yet uh, uh, given to the network during the training phase. So the network is able to generalize. Of course, as we were talking about the uh, averaging, uh, weighted averaging, we need to try to solve uh, average sum task with NTM. And as we can see, for numbers up to 10 bits, the NTM is able to converge, while for 16 bits, uh, it converges too slow by given that hardware that we use for training. But the idea here uh, and is simple. So NTM is quite a powerful architecture and uh, there are many other samples, uh, examples of NTM applied to solving some mathematical expressions, that NTM is able to learn that expression. So now, as we have solved this uh, subtask, we need to understand whether uh, we can perform and uh, whether we can uh, uh, have the neural architecture with that is not only able to learn the complex algorithm, but also can uh, learn TPR encoding and decoding rules. So, and here we try to apply NTM again. And here we can see that NTM was not able to generalize. So there are several things. Uh, the first one is that according to the architectural uh, specificity of the, of NTM. It is quite slow uh, during the training phase if the input sequence is quite big. So if the dimensionality of the input sequence is big, then NTM is slow and converges and uh, converges too slow. So here compared to the 10 bit numbers on the previous slides, so here is four, 104 bits. And of course it is not enough. So we cannot increase memory as much as we, as we want because it is a memory bound task. So, so this, uh, this brings us to the actual research questions. So can we make uh, the input uh, dimensionality uh, smaller or maybe we can feed uh, two tuples uh, elements uh, as separate items instead of trying to pass the whole TPR uh, to the network. Maybe we need to use some compact uh, VSA HD representation, but then uh, the question of information loss comes to the first um, point. So, so but, we all, but at the same time we heard uh, in the talk uh, by uh, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Smolensky is that uh, TPRs uh, can now work with some noise with 99% accuracy. So maybe that can be the further direction. So nevertheless, this is uh, uh, my current uh, state um, in this direction. So regarding the software solution, so there are also two important artifacts. So uh, there is the the NTM implemented in TensorFlow 2.3, which is actively maintained, so you're free to, to start using it uh, just today. Uh, the sum task is uh, supported there 
uh, as well as the average sum task. And the second thing is about TPRs. So again, there is a framework that allows you to work uh, with uh, TPRs, with the TensorFlow, uh, which supports uh, all the necessary tasks, which are encoding, decoding. We also proved that uh, it is possible to express uh, fixed point arithmetics with the tensor product representations. Uh, symbolic manipulations can be also expressed and it is also available in the framework. So that, for example, you can perform tree joining, extraction of the elements and so on. And uh, the networks are compiled, so they do not require training. So, um, so concluding my talk today, um, what are the future directions? And they are again split into two parts. So the first part is knowledge representation. So we, know, we, we made some proposal how to represent knowledge tree in a distributed form. But now we need to assess the dimensionality growth of TPR encoded knowledge trees. We all know how dimensionality grows. And in my recent paper uh, about uh, encoding and decoding of uh, trees, uh, there are some uh, evaluations of, um, of uh, resources required for encoding and decoding large trees. And also uh, it is beneficial and I believe it should be uh, my next step to evaluate other VSA and HD representations to probably find a more compact and uh, maybe even a lossless solution. So the second part is uh, reasoning. So about the reasoning is uh, of course uh, proposing a more compact data set. So I still think that uh, we can achieve a fully end-to-end -end system by providing the NTM with the two tuples uh, encoded as a TPR and to receive a fully fleshed TPR uh, representing the aggregated assessment. And also, of course, implementing a fully integrated neural symbolic decision support system based on uh, symbolic and some symbolic reasoning. So, um, so to sum up, uh, building the decision support systems uh, that are symbolic and sub-symbolic at the same time is an actual task. Uh, decision support system cannot be fully sub-symbolic because uh, certain components uh, and at least the, the decision maker, they uh, should have uh, an opportunity to, to make symbolic reasoning. Moreover, uh, neural networks cannot operate on the high levels of abstraction. So at the high level of abstraction, reasoning is purely symbolic. So decision support system should be hybrid. It cannot be uh, fully sub-symbolic. We showed that NTM can perform basic arithmetic operations, including the average sum with numbers of acceptable precision. So uh, that's why NTM can be utilized as a assessment aggregation, learnable component, and decision support systems. So here are our key papers. Uh, here is the paper about encoding the trees. This one is uh, about uh, the uh, conditional elements uh, and compiled networks. Uh, and um, here is the papers about the decision support systems and uh, their proposed methodologies. And finally, I want to say a great thank you to my uh, thesis advisor, Eduard Alexandrovich Babkin, and uh, to Denis Kliko uh, for uh, his help in reviewing this talk. So thank you. If you, I would be really glad to answer your questions. Um, of course, hopefully I will uh, take some slot, maybe, during one of the next seasons of the VCA online, uh, telling you more uh, insights of what I have uh, reached and also would be glad to hear a feedback, maybe to adopt uh, a research program with uh, your ideas. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Uh, great talk, uh, very uh, uh, educative. I learned many 
new things and uh, really cool to hear about a new potential application of well in your case tpr but uh, well i guess we can generalize to vsa and hd uh, computing so now i open the floor for questions uh, so please anybody un unmute yourself and uh, ask alexander I see. Well, maybe while uh, people are making their mind, uh, you know, and uh, about their questions, I am. Um, when I uh, I was listening to your talk, uh, I, um, I I mean first of all I have a question. So why do you need a sequential neural network architecture uh, really? I mean why can't you? I mean what prevents you from kind of using all the kind of um, all all the assessments that you extract at once uh, as an input? And and uh, and train say a, a normal feed forward neural network. Would it make any difference, or maybe I'm kind of thinking completely uh, wrong wrongly? Well, the thing here is that uh, we uh, wanted uh, to have uh, a network that is capable to learn some uh, uh, algorithm to solve the uh, the task. And uh, it was shown that the feed forward network, for example, it uh, cannot uh, do that uh, really well. So uh, even the recurrent networks such as uh, Elastium, they cannot do that. So, and the only memory augmented neural networks uh, demonstrated uh, uh, feasible results in um, solving these tasks. So that's why when we had the question of uh, learning the, um, for example, weighted average of uh, the numbers, the solution was, uh, the choice was quite obvious. Mm -hmm. We wanted something that uh, is proven to solve uh, the mathematical tasks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. I, I have a question about the, um... 102 bit two tuple TPR. So, where did the 102 bits come from? All right. Uh, the, uh, so, for that, I would better uh, show you the, the assessment. So, um, so here is the assessment. Uh, in general, uh, if we make it uh, as generic as possible, then each assessment has its own weight, its own uh, role index and role al alpha. So in, as soon as we want to have a fixed point representation, we make uh, an encoding uh, for each uh, value. And uh, once performing tensor, uh, tensor product representation encoding, we get these uh, 104 bits. Wonderful. Um, so, how much of that is the roll? How big is the roll and how big is the filler? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the filler is... Uh, the filler is, of course, much bigger. So, the roll, So as soon as there are free rolls, and uh, we know that in order to have a lossless unbinding, we need uh, to have rolls of uh, dimensionality free. So to be literally independent and orthogonal. So rolls are of size three, while uh, numbers are represented uh, either by 10 uh, vector of length 10, uh, some of them, and some of them of length five, as far as I remember. Okay, so you multiply the roll times the filler and you get 30 or 15, and then you, are you using nested embedding here? Is that why it grows another dimension or? 
Yes, yeah, so uh, we we get the dimension also of the assessment. So yes, it is an SD one. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a question. Please, yes, I, I see your hand, uh, uh, Rosa. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, it's uh, cool stuff. I um, am trying to understand uh, several things, which I uh, wasn't able to quite get. So um, in the case of uh, combining weighted, uh, computing weighted averages, um, it's, it's very interesting to see whether and show that neural Turing machines uh, can learn the things that you show uh, that they are learning for you and have learned before. Um, why is it that we want uh, to learn how to do weighted average, given that a single neuron computes a weighted average of its inputs, uh, and we usually take that as a, a competence that's just built in to um, a neural network? Uh, I didn't understand why we needed to learn how to compute weighted averages. Well, uh, you're absolutely right, uh, Paul, that uh, uh, it is a, it might to seem an overkill uh, to have, uh, to take a huge neural architecture and uh, try to, to train it to solve some uh, simple task. But the thing here is uh, that um, this is uh, the example, while uh, the overall idea is that uh, the aggregation rules in the decision support systems in the MCDM in particular, uh, they, uh, are, um, they are always handcrafted. And uh, every year we receive a lot of papers that explain how, an, how another can be the assessment aggregated. Instead, uh, what, uh, what is our idea is that we should not, uh, we should no longer decide and handcraft these aggregation rules. So they sh we should not uh, think of, um, of these aggregations and many others. Instead, uh, we have the historical data of uh, previous use cases. Then we fed it into the network. It learns the algorithm. It knows the algorithm, so it extracts it from the data. Then uh, when we next time go to the, to, to the network, to the, sub, to the sub-symbolic subsystem, then it is capable to provide us with uh, the aggregated result. And uh, for us, it is uh, uh, better because <clears throat> the weights are assigned uh, appropriately. The aggregation rule is uh, chosen by the network itself. And the network in future can learn from all the Mm, examples that uh, we had during time. That's a, that was exactly my other question, actually. So what, what is the nature of the training data? So you um, have individual, you have these, these tensors of evaluations by different experts on different criteria of different options. And um, uh, so that is the, uh, independent, uh, those are the independent variables for computing the uh, uh, recommendation for a choice, right? Uh, what is the uh, answer information that's in the training data, in the training data? So like you have this hierarchical process of combining assessments. Um, and so there are intermediate points at each level of the hierarchy where some subset of assessments have been combined. Do you have, uh, target values for those um, intermediate levels of assessment? Uh, what, what is the actual, what are the answers to this problem that are presented during training? Well, um, so uh, again, um, so there, is, there are several uh, levels of, of the answer. So first of all, um, mm -hmm. uh, when we uh, talk about, uh, so when you say that, uh, a training data is a encoded TPRs and then we give it to the network and then it uh, learns. 
So this is what um, is not yet achieved. So again, um, I am raising the question of how to properly organize the training uh, sets, so how to make it more compact, so that NTM will be able to uh, to work and train properly. Because as I said, it it behaves poorly uh, in case of a huge input sequence and. Uh, so this is one thing. So instead, during the training phase, uh, we fed the NTM with encoded um, uh, with encoded uh, expressions like this. So when we have a bit string which uh, stands for some particular arithmetic expression. So that's why training the network in our case does not uh, is is not. Um, uh, dependent on the availability of the historical data till till the moment then we integrate that into the real DSS. So as it is a simple arithmetic expression to this moment, then of course we can generate as, as much synthetic data as we want. So, and then we provide it as to the NTM and uh, it uh, solves the task. And the final thing, the third thing is that uh, there is no end-to-end -end, uh, training to this moment. So each uh, system which aggregates the assessments is a separate one. So if we take a look here, uh, then this uh, element is for each level is an independent network. So as I said, for the experts, it, it will learn to assign experts weights for the Criteria, it will assign a criteria level, criteria weights, and so on. So in training that part of the model, what, are, what is the target uh, values that the, uh, that's driving back propagation? What, what, what are the output values uh, that uh, error is computed over? Um, so mm -hmm. you, you know what the assessments were for these um, three different um, uh, elements, but, and you want to combine them and you want it to get the right answer, but what's the right answer? So here is the example of the training set. So, uh, but the, we, wait a minute. This, this, this is the training set for learning how to add 15 and nine and get 24. Mm -hmm. I get that, but that's not the, the training problem I'm trying to ask about. I'm trying to ask about what you had on the previous slide, which is the, the slide that you showed a moment ago. Um, not, sorry, the one that you just showed rather than the one before in the... Um... Okay, this one, I guess. Right, so, you know, we have, a, we have three on, on the left-hand side, the input to this network is three two tuples. And then there's an intermediate, uh, well, actually, then there are three... Um, so you extract those values from, and then you get these three two tuples in the middle, um, and then you aggregate them to get a single two tuple. How do you train step two in this model? You, what is the right answer for the two tuple that's supposed to come out of step two? Where, where does that number come from? Do you have data that says historically what the aggregated value of these three two tuples was or should be or? How does that get learned? Yes, uh, so again, um, there, are, there are two things. The first one is that uh, to this moment, I'm not using the historical data. So I'm using the synthetically generated data. And uh, that's why I know the, the answer for sure. So I just know how it should be properly aggregated, what weights it should assign. So how to, to take three tuples and get the, the last one. But in general, the idea is, uh, yeah, absolutely uh, right. Uh, so absolutely what you're saying. So we have the historical data and uh, then we compare it to the result, that, to the assessment, uh, to the decision that was made uh, by the expert, by the decision maker. And only then we can f feed it into the network and uh, only then it can uh, learn the proper ways. Okay, I, I understand better now at what stage this, this progress, the project is. Uh, thanks, Alex. Mm. Okay. So uh, uh, maybe once again, I would reiterate my 
question and I think it's kind of uh, um, mirror what Paul is asking. So I, what, are you trying to kind of learn uh, a symbolic algorithm with the neural network architecture? So basically giving, uh, giving a network any sequence of symbols, it would produce you yet another symbol according to learned algorithm. So basically training on 25 plus four, uh, you would give it, uh, I don't know, whatever assessment symbols you, you have, and then it will produce yet another symbol, uh, your two tuple. So you, is it something you try to do? Yes. So having TPRs, uh, so having the two tuple, Having let's 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 go um, in this way, having an, uh, a list of two tuples, each encoded as a tensor product representation, mm -hmm. and then we feed it to the network, and the network then outputs the single TPR. Yeah. When and when we encode decode it, we get the fully fleshed two tuple element. Yeah, yeah. I, this this I understood, but I mean, my my understanding was that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, what, that's why uh, that's why I asked about uh, feed forward neural net, and I, I think Paul also mentioned uh, the, the ability of a single neuron to to. So I mean, if you have a historical data, uh, then you can just train the weighted uh, kind of. Um, um, I mean, to, to, to train the network to produce the result based on weighting the input uh, encoded as TPRs. So that's uh, kind of my of my understanding. But I, I think I, I have a better understanding now. And then maybe another comment uh, from my side. I mean, if one, 104 bits is uh, uh, you consider as a long, <laughs> then the uh, VSA you normally work with substantially larger dimensionalities. Yeah, uh, I just why, why I'm saying so is that uh, uh, for me it was uh, a surprise that uh, uh, the, so before actually uh, dig into the um, architectural specificity of the of the network of the architecture. So when we even when we have 100 bits. Uh, while, for example, when we analyze text and uh, get embeddings, it is at least 300 uh, elements, uh, vectors. So even for 100 uh, bits, the network was very slow in training. So because it, uh, in, in definition, it uh, calculates the distance uh, each time. And uh, if, if it is a huge vector, then the distance is calculated quite, quite slowly. Yes. Um, anybody else want to ask Alex uh, a question? Okay. Well, uh, looks like we are reaching the limit. So it's, uh, well, for you, it's already uh, 10 past midnight, I guess. And uh, uh, seven minutes. <laughs> So uh, I would like to thank you once again for the great talk and uh, uh, cool discussion. So and once again, so uh, we uh, uh, take a short break for July and uh, we will resume our webinar series uh, in August 9th. Uh, so please check the website, but I will send out a, a reminder uh, in our mailing list. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for attention very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.